Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast. My name is Dr. Brian Reid, and today I am doing a solo episode talking about brain mapping and neurofeedback. This is a topic that I've been wanting to discuss on the podcast for a little while now. Uh, several of my guests have talked about neurofeedback a little bit and brain mapping and neurofeedback a little bit here and there, but I wanted to have a dedicated episode. And uh, while I am hoping to get a uh, have some guests down the road um, who specialize in or, or you know, heavily use brain mapping and neurofeedback in their practices. I wanted to have just sort of a dedicated episode getting into the background of you know what is brain mapping, what is neurofeedback, um, some of the ins and outs around it. And so I put together a slide so slideshow presentation to uh, cover all of those basics, and so I hope that it's going to be of interest. Um, just before getting into the content of the presentation, I'd like to invite you, if you haven't um, already, to uh, sign up for my mailing list, uh, my newsletter. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, then it'll be in the description below the video. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, it'll be in the show notes below, and uh, you can just um, click on the link there to sign up for the newsletter. Um, by signing up for the newsletter, you get uh, free access to the first two modules of my Overcoming Chronic Illness course. Uh, if you haven't heard me talk about that before, just a quick blurb on that. It's a course I put together uh, a couple of years ago, um, basically to help folks um, navigate the waters of complex chronic illness. There are so many topics to know about uh, when it comes to complex chronic illness, and uh, quite frankly, many of the patients I work with and many of the patients that my guests uh, who you know specialize in complex chronic illness also work with. Um, a lot of us find that patients with these really you know, notably um, debilitating, challenging um, conditions oftentimes have a lot of things going on. You know, it might be mold toxicity and chronic infections and heavy metals and SIBO or other gastrointestinal issues and mast cell activation syndrome and, and, and. There can be this you know, seemingly endless list of things that could be going on. And, th and thankfully, it's not an endless list, um, but there are several uh, really core or key topics to know about to really have a, a good sense of the lay of the land of what's actually going on with um, complex chronic illness. So that's why I put this course together. It basically goes over um, these key topics and there are um, resources within the course, these um, you know, handouts and summary sheets and things like that, that um, if you're working with a clinician who's you know, helping you with you know, X, Y, or Z components of your case, but you know, you're like, ah, I keep hearing people on Instagram or you know, on these podcasts or other people talking about like, you know, say, uh, you know, I've been getting worked up for SIBO and chronic Lyme disease, but you know, I keep hearing things about mold and mast cell activation syndrome, but my clinician doesn't really specialize in that, doesn't really know about those things. Well, there are resources um, from the course that can be passed on to your clinician to kind of get them up to speed, so to speak, give them a sense of like what kind of lab tests to run, what kind of treatments to consider, et cetera. So the, again, the intention of the course is to help folks who are you know, na navigating those waters of complex chronic illness to have a more robust understanding of the, the playing field that could be um, uh, applicable to their case, but then also to have those resources to um, share with a healthcare provider to you know, get the get get the best care possible, basically. So um, again, signing up for uh, my newsletter gets you uh, complimentary access to the first two modules of the Overcoming Chronic Illness course, and then you're also on my mailing list as well. And uh, I send out newsletters from time to time. Uh, definitely not bombarding uh, the inbox with newsletters, but um, newsletters from time to time just. Uh, maybe talking about upcoming podcast episodes, things I'm excited about in practice, um, various things like that. So little tidbits that come along. Um, so with that out of the way, let's get into the presentation here. I just need to figure out how to advance my slide. All right, sorry about the little pause there, um, something being a little finicky with my um, program that I'm using to record this. Um, so just a quick disclaimer, um, as per usual, none of the um, content that I put out there on social media should be, uh, or, or on the podcast should be um, construed as medical advice. This is for informational purposes only, and if you require medical advice, please consult with your healthcare provider to obtain that advice. So a quick outline in terms of what we'll be going over today. So first talking about what is a brain map, um, then getting into what our brain waves do, getting into some of the um, specifics of what an actual brain map looks like. So this will all make sense in the ensuing slides, but talking about something called a dominant frequency, um, coherence, and then examples of some brain maps. Um, we'll look at something called brain map signature patterns. 
then uh, talk about what is neurofeedback, which neurofeedback is kind of the natural uh, topic that pairs with brain mapping, as we'll uh, get into in, in, um, in several minutes here throughout the presentation. Um, then talk about um, what a follow-up brain map looks like after doing some neurofeedback sessions, um, and then a list of some of the conditions that neurofeedback is indicated for. So what is a brain map? So a brain map is obtained by using a device called a quantitative electroencephalogram, or a QEEG, being a much easier way of saying that. Um, an EEG, so just not a quantitative um, electroencephalogram, but just a regular electroencephalogram, is the type of diagnostic tool that a neurologist or analogous healthcare practitioner would work with to diagnose someone uh, to see if they have, or to assess someone to see if they have a seizure disorder. So essentially, it's something that measures brain waves. Um, but a um, quantitative EEG is used to actually quantify or enumerate essentially the brain waves that uh, are running in a person's in a person's brain. So uh, it's not a device that's used to detect seizure disorders. That's kind of a totally separate uh, sort of separate application, um, but it's the same type of technology that's used. So basically um, to an EEG uh, or QEG, QEEG rather um, involves using what kind of looks like a glorified shower cap that has sensors on it. I'll show you a picture on the next slide. Um, and those sensors, they pick up residual activity that are traveling uh, from the brain to the scalp. Um, so we, our brains are full of uh, nerves, of course. Those nerves are transmitting electrical impulses from one to another. So there's essentially a lot of electricity running around in our brain. And some of that electricity will actually diffuse across our scalps. Um, and it's undetectable, of course. It's not like you touch your head and you can feel little zings of energy or something. It's very, very, very low amounts of electricity that are transmitting from brain to scalp. Um, but using these sensors, and using a, a device called an amplifier to basically enhance the power or the output of the, the electricity that's detected, um, we can uh, essentially detect brain waves across the scalp. So it's, as it says here on the slide, it's akin to a you know, clinician putting a stethoscope on your chest and picking up the sound waves that are being created by your heart, but just detecting that across the, across the skin. Um, so the take home message is that um, the QEEG brain mapping is incredibly non-invasive. It's basically as about as invasive as putting a stethoscope on one's chest. It's just picking up that electrical residue that's going across the skin. It's not putting any energy into the person's body, like into the person's head. It's not using any frequencies or vibrations or any things like that. It's just picking up the um, information essentially that's uh, coming uh, from the brain across the skin, much like using a stethoscope to listen to a person's heart. And uh, then the computer software that's connected to the amplifier um, then creates this color-coded map of the brain. So let's. So um, so this is the um, uh, what a QEEG cap looks like. Um, so <clears throat> all of the little white circles, the six are well, you can kind of see the edges of a couple of other ones, but the six circles that are kind of closest to to our viewpoint here. Um, uh, something called electrogel, which is basically analogous to ultrasound gel, is um, administered inside of those sensors, um, basically kind of squirted inside using a, a special device. Um, and so then the gel creates the contact between the sensor, which are the little white circles, and then the patient's scalp, which you know uh, doesn't matter if a person's uh, bald as a billiard ball or you know has um, thick, luxurious hair. Um, we are able to get that connection going, and then it's uh, making that the gel makes the connection between the sensor and the scalp, and then the kind of the uh, tied up uh, apparatus at the uh, back of the person's head here in the picture um, that unravels into a cord that then plugs into the amplifier, and then that's what amplifies the signal, and then sends that um, information to the, uh, to the computer to make a brain map. And so this is what a brain map uh, looks like. So an example brain map. So we'll get into um, some of the, uh, we'll get into some of the specifics of this. Um, quite frankly, brain map interpretation, it's it's a bit of a, uh, a long process to get from the point of not knowing how to interpret a brain map to the point of interpreting a brain map uh, effectively and efficiently. Um, it's, it's quite a steep learning curve. It took me um, several months to kind of get my feet underneath me uh, in terms of doing the brain map interpretation. Um, so uh, if you're looking at this thinking like, what the heck am I looking Looking at, um, you know, we're, we're not going to all become brain map masters after the end of this uh, presentation. But I just want to give you a sense of like what the heck do these things actually look like to make it less abstract. Um, so. Looking at the um, top left corner, so obviously there's all these little brains. You know, the five brains across the top, five brains across the bottom. We'll uh, 
worry about some of the details in, in upcoming slides here to make a little more heads or tails of this but just say looking at the picture in the top left corner so there's all the different colored circles that you see there you know the red and yellow ones at the kind of top part of the picture and then you know some green ones and, and more red and yellow uh, red and yellow ones um, so all of those circles are um, um, uh, rep associated with the different sensors that are on the glorified shower cap, that QEEG cap. So there are actually 19 sensors on the cap in totals, um, and so each one of the little circles is the uh, output or the readout, if you will, from one of those sensors. Um, what we're, so, but it's like, okay, well, there's 19 sensors, but why the heck are there f uh, five brains? Well, as we'll talk about in a slide or two coming up here, <clears throat> there are four main brainwave frequencies that we look at um, going from left to right there's your delta your theta your alpha and your beta the high beta which is at the far right side of the picture um, that's basically just associated with muscle tension so it doesn't actually give us kind of functional insight into how the brain physiology is doing but it's still presented on because Anyways, there's kind of nuanced reasons why it uh, it is sometimes relevant with brain map interpretation, but generally we don't uh, it doesn't tell us about overall brain functionality in a, in a super meaningful way. There's again some exceptions to what I just said there, but for our purposes here, we'll just kind of ignore the high beta. Um, so for each uh, on each one of those brains, it's telling us uh, so in the one on the far left, you know, top left corner, I should say, um, that's telling us about the amount of delta at all of these 19 brain locations. The picture immediately to the right of that, that says theta underneath it, that's telling us how much theta is at each one of those 19 brain locations and then similar information for the alpha and the beta as well um, so when we're looking at the magnitude you can see again there's the color coding there's your yellow your red uh, your green your light blue and your dark blue and so um, that's essentially all of the circles should ideally be green uh, that would be con considered average or AVG as it says in the picture there um, if these uh, circles are red or yellow then that means they're high or very high respect uh, respectively so meaning that there's too much compared to the average norms of those brain waves so we can see they're in the delta like on the left side there at the top <clears throat> there's you know several circles that are red and yellow so meaning that this individual has more delta brain waves than would be ideal or would be average anyways and, and quite well in this case um, uh, we want things to be average maybe in other facets of life we don't want to be average it's nice to stand out from the crowd in this case we want to have a pretty average looking brain map uh, for, for the most part um, so uh, we can see that there's some high or very high uh, delta if we go over to theta we see most of the circles are green and actually that theta looks pretty darn good all things considered but we can see at the kind of bottom part of the brain like which is the posterior part of the brain um, we do see some pale blue circles so that's indicating that there's a bit of a lower amount of uh, theta in those brain regions than would be ideal um, and then I don't see any very lows any dark blues here which is which is good um, but there could be some very lows as well so um, kind of summarizing what we've talked about so far so you put on the glorified shower cap um, the, uh, sensors pick up the brain waves and then that turns the uh, the that information is then turned into this color-coded picture telling us about the various brain waves um, the second line or the second set of brains there so you can see above the top line of brains it says magnitude um, below that it says dominant frequency so we'll get into what dominant frequency means um, in, in a couple of slides coming up I just wanted to show you what a full brain map looked like so you could have a sense of what what um, what the results actually look like so we've, we're seeing magnitude at the top dominant frequency below that um, and then this is actually the exact same data like the exact same pictures just represented a different way so for some people's brains they kind of prefer to see things more in a picture format so here we can see the pictures of the brains at the top a little bit easier to see the ears and the nose for orientation um, but seeing that okay there's you know some red and yellow with the delta and a little bit of blue at the back of the brain like the posterior brain for the theta um, but this is just a different representation and then with the dominant frequency lower down we have these nice bar graphs which help to summarize things a little bit more too so it's just kind of exact same data but just different ways of looking at it and uh, just the other uh, half of the um, brain map results so you can see at the top left there it says interconnectivity and then the section below that um, says asymmetry so there's just these are just other uh, ways of kind of looking at the data that's gained from the brain map um, and kind of analyzing it in different ways so we can uh, draw uh, additional conclusions about what's going on with the person's brain physiology so again I'll get into what the significance of this is coming up in a few slides and then these are the exact same sections again just um, depicted as these little bar graphs as opposed to the the pictures that we saw on the previous slide
So what do our brain waves do? So when everything is going well, um, our delta waves are primarily involved with um, sleep. So during the daytime, not a big deal, but uh, if a person listening to this is suffering from insomnia, it's like, oh, I think I want to hear more about those delta waves because they're they are certainly very important for getting into to sleep, including you know getting into deep sleep, and also important for brain stem functions. Uh, theta waves are important for memory and emotions, which essentially um, is what our limbic system controls. Um, alpha is, brain waves are largely for resource management of cognitive activities. There's certainly more. It's certainly more nuanced than what I'm about to say, but a good, generally a good way to think about alpha is it's kind of like your background uh, running program. Like so, when you're going about your day-to-day -day, uh, business, you know, you're um, thinking about my own life, you know, like uh, getting breakfast for the kids in the morning, um, you know, driving to work, um, you know, working at your job, you know, doing kind of your more, like, kind of like your your standard tasks, if you will, you're going to be running an alpha a lot of the time. Uh, there's every brain waves doing, we have all the brain waves in our brains at all times, but in terms of what our more um, sort of primary uh, brain waves are at given you know, time um, uh, around given activities, alpha is kind of like our just you know, kind of our basic operating system in a sense. And um, then beta is our uh, most excitatory brain wave. It has to do, as it says here, with activation and cognitive processing and the cortex of the brain. So if a person gets really excited about something, and that could be, you know, so good excited um, or maybe bad excited about something, they're really worked up about something or they're anxious or fearful about something, there's going to be more beta running around. And um, the and then also when we're you know learning something new when we're you know there's something i don't know if a patient comes into my office and you know they say like oh you know by the way like i spread a third arm out of my back can you help me with that you know i'm gonna have a lot more beta going on than alpha in that moment it's like oh my gosh i've never seen a third arm growing out of somebody's back before um this is you know going to be more a more challenging situation for me um so uh, beta is something that certainly plays a significant role in our, our you know, sort of day-to-day -day, um, kind of uh, sort of standard activities in our lives. But um, if, if we have more like excitation or anxiety or nervousness about things, then we're going to tend to have uh, more beta happening. So again, previous slide was when things are going well. So these are kind of just, those are the um, standard operations or standard areas, I should say, of our neurological function that those brain waves impact. When things are not going so well though, when we have um, too much or too little of different brain waves, then things can start to go awry. So if we look at a brain map and we see that there's say too much delta uh, brain waves, that can be associated with traumatic uh, brain injury. So like say post-concussion or something like that. Um, it's associated with inflammation, which could be from various causes. Um, one of the many reasons why brain mapping and, and the neurofeedback, which is the basically the treatment, if there's things off kilter with a brain map, we could use neurofeedback to get things back on track. Um, one of the many reasons that I'm very happy to have brain mapping and neurofeedback available at my clinic is because I treat so many patients with neuroinflammation. I, of course, a huge focus in my practice is complex chronic illness. Um, and what's I think well very fascinating to me and something that's a little bit of a, a little bit of a confirmation bias, if you will, um, for me is that um, it seems that it, all of the conferences now on complex chronic illnesses, there's just more and more presentations about, yeah, there's a lot of chronic, um, there's a lot of chronic neuroinflammation underlying mold illness, chronic infections, mast cell activation syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems like this neuroinflammation is really, really um, very relevant to folks in the complex chronic illness world. And the fact that we have a tool that can work to help measure that, and then also a therapy in the form of neurofeedback to help um, mitigate that or rectify that um, is very, very exciting to me and something I've been doing quite a bit of in practice and um, yeah, very, very pleased to have this uh, assessment and treatment tool um, in, in my tool belt now. Um, so uh, with too much delta, it could also be associated with emotional trauma, which subsequently will cause neuroinflammation as well as it turns out. Um, if there's not enough delta, that can also be associated with a traumatic brain injury. So 
Long and short of it is if the um, brain has been under duress for a prolonged period of time, you could actually start seeing low delta, um, which was associated more with, um, you know, possible, uh, it could be associated with you know, more cognitive decline and things like that. You can also see too little delta if there's low dopamine, so it could be something we'd see in folks with, say, a Parkinson's diagnosis, and also if there's some white matter damage, um, so basically brain damage. Um, with theta, if there's too much theta, that could lead to ADHD symptoms. Um, as a quick little side note, I think that um, kind of a separate topic, which I'd like to actually have a podcast episode about at some point, um, is just, um, I think it's important to uh, make a distinguishing point that um, ADHD in our society has been largely pathologized for, for you know, many decades. Um, Thankfully, there have been you know, a growing number of experts in this area who are working to try to sort of depathologize ADHD. It's really more that folks with an ADHD diagnosis, it's it's really more that they're neurodivergent. Their brains just work differently than neurotypical individuals. It's actually not a pathology or a bad thing, but of course, um, trying to fit, uh, live in um, a non-ADHD conforming world as a person with an ADHD brain can be challenging. So certainly not saying that life in you know our society is easy um, or without challenges for folks with ADHD. Obviously, that's a reason it's been pathologized because um, folks with uh, you know that type of nervous system um, presentation can run into a lot of challenges with you know the standard schooling system and certain workplaces and things like that. Um, but just I think it's an important distinguishing point that ADHD, to my understanding, is really not a pathology in the truest sense of the word. It's more just a neurodivergence and neuro neurological difference. So just making that distinction there. Um, so I specifically say here, you know, ADHD symptoms. In other words, if okay, a person has an ADHD brain, well, if there are things about their neurological function that make it harder to function in this world, you know, in school, work, relationships, whatever it happens to be, then um, that can be associated with having too much theta. And we can use neurofeedback to uh, help to balance out that theta to help, you know, sort of um, strive to, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, kind of like take away the bad stuff, but still keep the good stuff because there's a lot of advantages of having an ADHD brain as well. So again, have another podcast about that at some point. Uh, there's several good ones out there already I've, I've, uh, that I've listened to. But anyways, um, just a little distinction there about the ADHD symptoms. But too much theta would be kind of a classic thing that would be seen if a person was having um, challenges with, you know, related to ADHD type symptoms. Um, also, if there are executive function deficits happening or low cortical perfusion, so in other words, not enough blood flow um, getting to the cortex of the brain, which is obviously not a good thing. So maybe, you know, someone would say like vascular dementia or maybe there's impaired blood flow because of POTS or some other type of dysautonomia. If there's not enough theta, so too little theta could be or can be associated with memory deficits and also reduced emotional awareness. And uh, just as a point of clarification, when we're looking at the brain map, everything I'm saying here about too much, too little of delta or theta, um, this is in the magnitude section. So the very first section that we looked at. And again, we'll look at an example. So hopefully it'll, it'll make more sense as we go along. But this is all with respect to magnitude. If we have too much alpha, that's associated with, uh, or can be associated with chronic anxiety, sleep deprivation, depression, and hypothyroidism. Too little delta can be associated with excessive stress, brain fog, and then also reduced cognitive stamina. So brains getting tired too easily. Um, too much beta is associated with, so remembering that beta is our, you know, really um, excitatory, like, you know, high energy brainwave. So too much beta, so too much of that excitatory, um, you know, high energy brainwave is going to manifest as uh, things such as uh, worry, um, chronic hyperarousal. So just kind of being like kind of on all the time, uh, sort of like hyper hyper vigilant, um, and then can lead to hypermentation as well. So excessive thinking or rumination. If we don't have enough beta, then that can be associated with the reduced cognitive efficiency and also low mitochondrial function, um, interestingly enough. Um, so again, if we don't have enough of that, like, you know, get up and go kind of beta, then it's like, yeah, there's not going to be as much cognitive efficiency because we kind of need that beta to sort of stoke the fires of our, um, yeah, our, our cognitive efficiency. Um, one of the um, kind of mnemonics that has been helpful for me when I'm looking at patients' brain map results and explaining their results is a good way to think about alpha and beta is that, again, where alpha is kind of like our sort of basic operating mode and then beta is more of like the necessary bits of like increased um, excitation or, or stimulation that we need, you know, throughout the day when we're encountering 
challenges or needing to you know perform at our you know to our to our, our best ex extent so to speak um, a good general way to think about alpha and beta is that alpha is kind of like the parasympathetic nervous system so sort of like our rest and digest nervous system which ideally most of the time we'd kind of be living in that parasympathetic mode not in like a the opposite of the sympathetic mode which is our stressed out state or our fight or flight mode um, whereas beta would be our sympathetic or fight or flight mode so um, again the mnemonic for me is like yeah we want generally good alpha through the day but we want little spikes of beta through the day to you know again again you know get over or um uh, meet challenges that we're faced with or you know um if we're going to exercise you know we want more beta to like kind of rev our systems up that type of thing but we don't want to be living in high beta all the time uh, we also don't want to be living in high alpha um, all the time either um, so the, the long and short of it is uh, just again kind of a little mnemonic that's been helpful for me um, alpha is akin to the parasympathetics beta akin to the sympathetic nervous system and again, just like the delta and the theta on the previous slide, everything I'm talking about here on this slide is in relation to the magnitudes, or that's pr um, presented in the magnitude section of the brain map. So going back to the uh, sample brain map from a few slides ago, so if we take a look at this and say, okay, so now we've learned about magnitude, here's the magnitude section of the brain map. So you know, what can we learn from looking at this person's brain map? So looking at the delta on the left side, we see, hmm, there's, some red and some yellow there. So there's kind of too much delta, which would be associated with um, neuroinflammation, possibly from a traumatic brain injury. So looking at this and kind of knowing about this patient's history uh, where they didn't have, you know, history of a traumatic brain injury, uh, but they did have a history of notable mold exposure, or chronic infections. It's like, okay, it looks like there's still some neuroinflammation related to that. Now, this person had been undergoing treatment for um, some time, you know, doing way better than they were previously, you know, notable improvements with energy and uh, neurological symptoms and things like that. Uh, but looking at the brain maps, like, well, it looks like there's still, you know, a little something um, that's, there's still something going on there with some neuroinflammation. Um, looking at the next brain over on um, the theta. So there is a little bit of low theta in the um, occipital lobe there, or the, well, the occipital lobe and, and also the um, posterior aspects of the temporal and parietal lobe on the right side. Um, doesn't look too bad, um, but that would be associated with some memory deficits. So, you know, just again, knowing this individual, um, there is, you know, a little bit of memory compromise, but nothing too major. So that seems proportionate. Um, alpha looks pretty darn good. We see a couple of uh, locations where there's some lower alpha, which can be, um, um, you know, potentially problematic for some folks, but generally like doesn't seem to be uh, an issue with this patient's case. And it's only two of the 19 locations. So alpha overall looks pretty darn good. Um, and then beta, we see that there are a few locations that are elevated. Um, so of the 19 locations, you know, five of them are high or very high. So not too bad. You know, again, this patient's made a lot of good headway, has done a lot of um, stress management work and things like that, a lot of mind body work. So um, beta is not looking too, too bad, but there is still some higher beta than would be ideal. So, and then the high, the, the high beta, um, also known as gamma, is the other name for high beta. Um, again, we, it's really just reflective of muscle tension um, in the person's body. So uh, if they were maybe clenching their jaw a bit, or they were keeping some tension in their uh, shoulder muscles, like their trapezius muscles during the scan, like that might be why we'd see a little bit of high beta, but it's really not clinically relevant for interpreting the brain map. So the next section of the report looks at dominant frequency. I'll just spend a very small amount of time on this because it's it's a little bit of a complex topic, kind of, um, and it's not the it doesn't give us you know um, catastrophically relevant amounts of information about a patient's brain map. It's the, the magnitude is, to my understanding, like really the the bread and butter of the brain map. Um, but then when we learn about uh, what we do see from dominant frequency and also coherence, which we'll talk about in the next slides, um, that does um, help to shape our understanding of what's happening with the magnitude. And then um, the brain asymmetry, which we'll look at coming up as well, that, that is um, very relevant as well. So the dominant frequency, I'll just kind of touch on that briefly. So every brain wave has a frequency range in which it exists. So the gamma, also known as high beta, is any uh, fre frequency that's above 35 hertz that's detected, that is um, high beta. Um, just regular beta is anywhere between 12 and 35 hertz, alpha is 8 to 12 hertz, theta is eight, uh, 4 to 8 hertz, and then delta is 0 0.5 to 4 hertz. So um, as it says here at the bottom, ideally we want the majority of the brain waves to be in the middle of that, this range. So 
um, again, like, you know, any brainwave, say for alpha, that's an 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12, it's all considered alpha. But generally speaking, um, it's best if most of the alpha, if the majority of the alpha is around like the 10-ish range, like 9.5, 10. That's kind of your ideal, like, sweet spot alpha. Um, be kind of like if you were, you know, firing arrows at a at a target, um, and like you know, all of your shots are within within the target, but like ideally you get a bullseye. Um, you want to be, you know, kind of right in the middle. Um, that's going to that's associated with sort of the, essentially the best health outcomes. Um, so as we'll see here on the next slide, because again, um, you know, what what are the consequences of not being in the middle of that range? Um, then we can see certain patterns, and these are all things that have um, been demonstrated in the scientific literature. So um, brain um, uh, neurofeedback, I should say, has been in the research literature since the 1970s, so it's been around for a very, very long time. In terms of brain mapping, I, I keep forgetting to double check on the exact date when that started happening, but I believe that brain mapping has been um, done for around 30 years or so, give or take, and so there have been lots and lots of research studies done looking at um, brain map patterns and they've derived a number of different um, conclusions um, based on that um, scientific data so there's just kind of a hodgepodge list here um, just run through it here quickly but if a person has um, a, tra a traumatic brain injury so a tbi then generally there's going to be slow waves across the board so we're going to tend to see you know slower beta slower alpha slower theta slower delta so the alpha for this for a person with a tbi would tend to be more around like the eight or the nine range as opposed to like you know the 9.5 10 range or, or or higher for that matter um, the theta would be you know more around like the four or five hertz range as opposed to ideally sitting more around like say six or so give or take um, so generally going to see lower um, uh, kind of s a slower frequency um, uh, brainwaves across the board with a TBI or a traumatic brain injury. Uh, with dementia, you generally see more slow waves um, in general as well. So kind of also makes sense given challenges that come with dementia as well as TBIs. Uh, slow alpha can be associated with demyelination of the nerves, which, you know, the most extreme example of that would be a condition like multiple sclerosis, but generally we don't want to have demyelination going on. Uh, fast high beta tends to be due to muscle tension, as I, as I touched on before. Uh, fast beta, not high beta, but just regular beta, is associated with worry or anxiety. And uh, slow beta um, generally means slower processing speed. And slow delta... Um, if there's slow delta, then that can interfere with cognitive processing. And so here's a brain map example looking at the dominant frequency. So we can see here that delta is all green, which is great. So that's um, that's mid, as it says there. So kind of just your average, like it's mid-range for the frequency range. Um, beta is looking pretty darn good, just that one red one in the middle, but generally looks good. Um, and then we see that alpha is all slow, so all you know lower range. That'd be more like your eight or nine hertz frequency. And then theta we see is all fast, um, but as just a little nuance, um, there's really um, there's really no such thing as fast theta. Um, the computer software, um, the you know, brain mapping software, isn't able to distinguish between what's really low alpha or what's um, really high theta. And so if we see lots of high theta, it's actually just a reflection of it being actually low alpha. So um, in this case, the person's theta is fine. Um, it's just a reflection that there's this low alpha. So a case like this, you know, looking at this brain map, we say, well, um, overall, everything looks quite good, but that alpha is mighty slow and so uh, doing some further investigation into you know what's happening with their myelination um, or you know are they having some neurological symptoms or if not then let's get some therapies in place to get that alpha looking normalized so that we don't you know run into some demyelination down the road so brain coherent coherence so just another kind of quick topic here um, so coherence is looking at the interconnectivity of different brain regions in other words um, how well are different regions of the brain communicating um, really quite simply there's either your um, hyper coherence so too much coherence will result in a lack of functional differentiation too little coherence is going to result in a lack of functional coordination 
So the way I think about this is that if there's too much chit chat or chatter, I should say, uh, between different brain regions, um, it would kind of be like an office building and, you know, everybody's getting along really well, but they're all just kind of chatting too much. You know, they work for like two minutes at their desk and then they're up and, you know, chatting with somebody across the hall about their weekend or something like that. Um, and ultimately that's not going to result in um, a lot of kind of new things being done. Um, so they might, you know, be able to check emails and answer the phone and stuff, but they're not going to be kind of getting into new projects and things. So there's not going to be that functional differentiation. And folks with um, excessive coherence, you know, tend to be folks who have more um, neuroinflammation, tend to have higher beta. So the brain waves are kind of firing a little too haphazardly. Um, and so that's um, ultimately going to um, result in this, uh, as it says here, this lack of functional differentiation. Um, so it's going to be harder, for, like say in a traumatic brain injury or a neuroinflamed brain, there's going to be less um, capacity for the brain to heal um, and, and get back on track, which of course is what we want when there's neuroinflammation, uh, whether it's related to a TBI or not. Um, on the other hand, hypocoherence or too little coherence is associated with functional or a lack of functional coordination. So in this case, it's kind of like going back to the office um, building example. It's like, you know, no one chatting at all. They're all kind of doing their work in their little silos, like in their little cubicles, but nobody's actually um, uh, you know, coordinating things. So it turns out like, oh, Bob and Bill and Tony, they're all, you know, working on the exact same project. They all get it done. And like, oh, great. You know, we each spent a week working on this project. We all did the exact same project. It was just, you know, there was poor coordination. So these resources were kind of wasted, so to speak. Um, so that's um, sort of a, an example of what this uh, hypo coherence would look like. So um, like many things in life, we want things to be just right, you know, uh, the Goldilocks effect. So with coherence, we want it to be in the middle. We don't want hyper, we don't want hypo, we just want a an average amount of coherence, which is going to be associated with the best um, differentiation and coordination of neurological function. So here's a coherence example. So we can see in the top picture, these are, um, uh, this is the same, um, both of the pictures are from the same brain. Uh, it's just looking at it in two different ways. So the top is the uh, summary, or sorry, is the location map. The bottom is the summary graph, as they call it. Um, so at the top, we see that there's a lot of um, red, which is high, so hyper coherence. Um, and so uh, as opposed to trying to you know, make heads or tails of the picture, it's kind of nice to have that um, summary graph, that bar graph at the bottom showing that in terms of hypo connectivity, things look quite good. Um, they're only 6% off from kind of optimal or, or, or normal. Um, so, you know, in terms of that um, hypo connectivity bar graph on the bottom left side there, that little black bar should ideally be all the way at the far right, but it's only 6% off from there. So that's pretty darn good. Whereas the hyper connectivity, well, we see that that's, you know, much of the way, 72% of the way towards being, you know, way too hyper. So it's quite, you know, 72% of the way from normal. Um, so it's um, handy to see those, uh, the bar graph to kind of um, summarize things a little more easily for us. So just a quick note about brain map signature patterns. So we, um, you know, as discussed already, we can learn a lot about um, a person's neurological um, health and function looking just at, you know, well, looking at the magnitude, which gives us, again, a lot of the information we're looking for, but getting um, some additional sort of insight as far as the um, dominant frequency and the coherence go. But one of the things that I really like about brain mapping is looking for these signature patterns. Um, I really love looking for patterns. I, you know, that's just, it's probably a good thing that I'm a naturopathic doctor and I, you know, try to solve patient cases all the time because, uh, yeah, looking at patterns, I like it and I'm good at it, um, thankfully. So, um, so the signature patterns are, um, I, I think really quite fascinating. So we'll talk about a few examples here. Um, so one is the hypersensitive patient example. Um, I, I don't think I mentioned here, um, I was thinking about what I wanted to say during this presentation and I, I don't think I actually mentioned it here in the recording. Um, one of the reasons that I um, decided to get into, to, to bring um, brain mapping and neurofeedback into my practice is because I interviewed another clinician, uh, Dr. Jabin Moore, he's a chiropractor in Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, he was uh, talking about neurofeedback uh, during our interview. And he was, uh, and I certainly don't speak for Dr. Moore, but my understanding from what uh, what he said was that in his practice, he uses neurofeedback and it can be really helpful for folks who are hypersensitive. And my ears perked up at that because I've treated hundreds and hundreds of patients who are very, very sensitive. You know, they flare up really easily from supplements and different treatments and things like that. And, and so 
my take home message from what he said was that when he used the neurofeedback, it helped to really reduce the patient's sensitivity. And then it, so that helped them to feel better, uh, which is great. But then also it gave them the ability to start actually taking some supplements and herbs and things like that. So they could, or antibiotics or whatever it was that they might need. So they could actually get well a heck of a lot faster because it's really hard to treat people when they can't take the treatments or can't take many of the treatments that you're recommending. Um, so there's actually this hypersensitive signature pattern that uh, we'll talk about in the uh, upcoming slides here. And a big thank you to Dr. Moore for uh, yeah um, opening my eyes to that. I, it was an application of neurofeedback that I wasn't aware of before chatting with him. Um, we'll talk about a mold toxicity signature pattern, a chronic pain signature pattern, an anxiety signature pattern, and a depression signature pattern. So the hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity signature pattern um, presents with elevated uh, relative beta. Um, we'll talk about the relative beta in the, um, oh, actually misspeaking there. Okay, so elevated relative beta um, is uh, speaking about beta magnitude. So we see high beta magnitude, um, strong frontal beta asymmetry. This is what I was starting to say there. We'll look at um, the asymmetry in the beta asymmetry in the anxiety signature pattern in more detail. Um, so we see elevated um, uh, beta magnitude. We see this asymmetry. We tend generally see, generally see fast alpha as the dominant frequency. Uh, we tend to see delta deficits. So this would be like basically low delta magnitude. Um, and then we would see excess beta um, connectivity. So basically beta hyper coherence. So again, um, you know, the magnitude tells us a lot, but then knowing about the dominant frequency, knowing about the coherence, um, it just, again, helps to add more um, color or flavor to getting a better sense of like, what is this brain map actually uh, representing or telling us about the patient? So that's the hypersensitive signature pattern the mole toxicity signature pattern, um, generally it's kind of elevated everything in magnitude. Um, so elevated delta magnitude, alpha magnitude, theta magnitude, uh, beta magnitude, but then you might also see fast uh, beta dominant frequency as well. And probably some hypercoherence. I mean, that's something that I've been seeing in a lot of my mole toxic patients. It's not to my understanding, part of the official signature pattern. I didn't come up with these signature patterns. This is what uh, mentors uh, who, uh, you know, brilliant, uh, the, some of the brilliant minds in the brain mapping world have come up with, um, but I've definitely seen the beta um, uh, hypercoherence as well. Chronic pain signature pattern um, would present with increased beta magnitude and uh, some cases might have slow alpha. So this is a case of a signature pattern where it's not very specific and that's like, well, like high beta, well, that could be related to other things too. Um, and so this is a, a great case in point where we need to see, well, what's happening clinically with a patient and then what does their brain map look like? So if someone comes in and they say, doc, I'm in chronic pain, you know, the rest of me feels pretty good. Um, and then they have a high beta and say, well, that high beta is probably related to their, um, to the chronic pain. And hopefully by Dan regulating, Dan regulating that beta, then their, um, say using, by do you say using neurofeedback that their pain levels would, you know, diminish and, and get better over time. Um, whereas say a patient came in and they said, you know, I'm like really anxious. I'm having trouble sleeping. I have a lot of migraines. Um, I've got some digestive issues and you know, I do have like, you know, some aches and pains in my joints. They're not too bad or aches and pains in my muscles. They're like, you know, say mild to moderate. Well, if I looked at their brain map and I saw high beta, I'd be thinking, well, maybe the, you know, mild to moderate pain that they're experiencing is related to that. But I'd be thinking, well, it might be, or it might be that they have some, you know, arthritis or they have, they're not stretching enough or they are, I don't know, that their workplace is too hard on their body or something like that. Um, whereas the high beta magnitude would very likely be related to the anxiety and insomnia and migraines and things like that that the person's experiencing. So again, it's just um, great to look at the brain map, but also, of course, really important to match that with what the heck is going on clinically with the patient. Anxiety signature pattern. Um, so with the anxiety signature pattern, it's looking at um, something called beta asymmetry. So starting in the bottom right corner, um, we can see there it says normal beta asymmetry. Um, and so ideally that little black line would be all the way to the left um, in the left dominant. Um, and in this case, and some, one of my, my very few complaints about um, the, uh, the brain map um, reports is that sometimes the percentages seem a little bit counterintuitive. So in this case, um, the normal beta asymmetry is um, 
essentially 87% away from where it should be, um, or it's 13% away from being as bad as it possibly could be. Um, so as we see on the, um, just to the left of that, where it says normal alpha asymmetry, which we'll talk about in the depression signature pattern in just a second, ideally we want that to be all the way to the right, which it is. Um, so it's at 100%, uh, which, which is good. So it's 100% asymmetry. Um, for the beta, it's only 13% asymmetry. So again, the numbers maybe are a little bit confusing, but ideally we want as much asymmetry as possible. Um, so only 13% beta asymmetry is bad. It's, you know, 87% 80, of the way of where it should be. Um, so why do we want asymmetry? You know, most things in life, we want things to be symmetrical. Um, why do we want asymmetry in this case? Well, the long and short of it is that we should have, uh, relatively speaking, um, a lot more beta brain waves in our left hemispheres than in our right hemispheres of our brains. Um, and if we don't have, and if that's flipped, if we have more beta in our right than in our left, then that's very commonly associated with anxiety. So that's why this is the anxiety signature pattern. So in this case, the beta asymmetry is, is kind of flipped. If we look at the picture above with all the little brains, if we look at the beta brain, so the one that's you know sort of second from the left at the top there, um, we see that there's low a lot of low beta on the left and there's almost all the locations on the right are high beta or, or red, and that should be flipped. Um, ideally, they just all be green, but um, barring that, at least we'd want the red to be on the left and the blue to be on the right. Um, unfortunately, it's flipped, and so the reason that it's you know only 13% uh, of the optimal asymmetry is we can see there's only one red one at the you know frontal part, like the top of the the left there and the beta brain, and uh, then the opposite side is is blue. So um, this person's almost like you know 100% like asymmetrical in the wrong way. So that that's the um, classic anxiety signature pattern. So by using neurofeedback to help balance that back out, then um, that can significantly reduce anxiety symptoms. The depression signature patterns, the exact same spiel, um, just we're looking at alpha in this case. And in this case, we want there to be more alpha on the right and less alpha on the left. So in this case, you know, um, on the bottom left there, um, in terms of the bar graph, that normal alpha asymmetry ideally would be all the way at the right at 100%. Um, this person's you know 75% um, in, in the wrong direction, so to speak. Their beta also doesn't look fantastic at 56%, but better, better than the last one at least, better than 13%. So if we look at the top picture with the five brains there, the alpha in the middle, um, ideally we would see um, most of the red or all of the red actually being on the in the right hemisphere uh, so on the right side but we see that the majority of it is indeed in the left hemisphere so that's the depression signature pattern so with all of that discussion about brain mapping out of the way um, let's talk about neurofeedback so what is neurofeedback um, neurofeedback um, you don't, excuse me, your neurofeedback utilizes operant conditioning to modify brain waves in a precise manner. Um, so in other words, the brain map tells us what's out of balance as we just spent, I'm looking at the clock here, about 45 minutes talking about, thanks for hanging in there. Um, and we use neurofeedback to bring the brain waves back into balance. And we can do that in a really precise way. So if a patient comes in and we see like, okay, they've got a lot of anxiety, they've got way too much beta on the right and you know not enough beta on the left, we could use neurofeedback to flip that, to basically train the left brain to have more beta, the right brain to have less beta. And on a subsequent brain map, we should see that looking better and of course there's no guarantees in life but what we should see based on you know lots of clinical experience and research literature and all of that we should see um, a an improvement if not a resolution of those anxiety symptoms so that's that's kind of neurofeedback in a nutshell it's kind of the antidote to what uh, or it, it's the attempted antidote the brain map shows us to be off kilter. Um, just a couple little bullet points about neurofeedback, and I'll get into more details about it in a moment. Um, but neurofeedback is passive. Um, it's easy to do. Um, basically, you just have to sit there doing nothing, so it's pretty darn easy. Um, and it's also non-invasive. So just as with the uh, brain mapping itself, it's just the glorified shower cap picking up the electricity going across a person's scalp. Um, neurofeedback similarly is just picking up um, electrical signals across the scalp. It's not putting any electricity or energy into the person's body at all. It's an entirely non-invasive process. Um, and I'll talk about what it actually involves on the next slide. 
So um, the picture on the right is um, the best picture I could find um, online. The um, credit there is in the bottom left corner of where I got the picture from. It's the best picture I could find um, giving a decent sense of what uh, neurofeedback setup looks like. So you can see there on this gentleman's head, there's a couple of sensors that are attached. Um, there are, uh, there's a little bit hard to see, but it looks like there's some sensors attached to his earlobe as well. Um, and then he's looking at something on the screen. So he's doing some eyes open neurofeedback. And I'll talk about the difference between eyes open versus eyes closed neurofeedback in just a second. Um, but the, the punchline here is that um, you don't have to put the full shower cap on to do neurofeedback, thankfully, because it's, it's a bit of a it takes a bit of time to do that. It's not a big deal, but uh, it's a lot more convenient than having to put on the full shower cap every time. Um, so as it says in the bullet points, um, so one to two sensors are placed on the head. Um, so this gentleman's case looks like there's you know a couple of sensors there on the right side of his of his noggin. Um, and then there's also ear clips, and then there's also a ground placed somewhere. So in our clinic, we just put a sensor on the little bone behind one of the, on the patient's ears called the mastoid process and just acts as a ground. Um, so those sensors are put in place, and then we either do eyes closed neurofeedback or eyes open neurofeedback. So I'll um, describe what eyes closed neurofeedback looks like, and then um, we'll, I'll quickly describe how eyes open looks because it's the exact same principles, just, just a little bit different. So with eyes closed neurofeedback, the way it works is the sensors are placed at the correct locations on the head. So ideally, we've had a brain map done ahead of time. It's not mandatory to do a brain map ahead of time. There are certain um, empirical protocols that have been research validated over time to help with various conditions. So for example, if a person said, you know, I, I can't get into a clinic to do brain mapping, um, but I want to do some neurofeedback. Well, there are certain research validated protocols that could be used to um, help try to address those symptoms without actually doing a brain map. Ideally, though, we'd have the brain maps, so then we can a, get some objective data to see, well, what's actually going on with your brain? Is Are your brainwaves actually off kilter in the first place or not? But then um, it would also allow us to create a targeted, tailored protocol to say, oh, well, your brain map looks like this. We want it to look like this. So let's have the neurofeedback be you know, sort of precisely geared towards what your brain map looks like as opposed to using more of an empirical protocol. So it just uh, allows for a more tailored protocol. But um, empirical protocols are, are certainly uh, valid as well. Um, so with the uh, eyes closed protocol, the sensors are placed on certain regions of the head. Um, might be you know both locations at the very back of the head, both on the forehead, uh, one just at the very vertex of the head, one above each ear, just kind of depends on which uh, brain regions we're, we're training. Um, so the sensors are put in place. And with eyes closed neurofeedback, we use music for that. So there'd be some music that was pre-selected um, to be playing in the background. Um, and then the person just sits there with their, oh, and then we um, tell the computer software, of course, what we actually want to do. So if say we wanted to say a person has too much beta and we want to lower that beta, we tell the computer software we want there to be less beta brain waves. So we tell the computer software what we want, we have the music ready to go, sensors are in place, and then the patient's basically sitting in a chair, you know, comfortable chair with their eyes closed and um, just not moving more than they absolutely have to. So of course the person can breathe if they need to scratch their nose for a second, if they need to sh you know, shift their position to get more comfortable, that's fine. But generally they want to, we want them to sit as still as they can for, for the neurofeedback session. Um, <clears throat> as I say on the next slide, uh, it's typical neurofeedback sessions about 30 minutes in length just to give you a sense of that. So um, as a person sitting there with their eyes closed, then the sensors are reading their brain waves in real time. Just like the glorified shower cap was reading the brain waves in a non-invasive way, those sensors are reading the brain waves at those regions of the brain that we want to work on training. And the sensors are basically um, saying, well, I'm talking to the computer software and the computer software is saying, okay, we want there to be less beta. So sensors, if you detect that there's less beta, then we're going to reward this person's brain by playing the music that was pre selected. Um, music gives us a little bit of a dopamine release. We get a bit of a reward from that. And so it's basically a way of rewarding the brain when it has less beta. Um, but the computer software says, but sensor, if you notice that there's too much beta, then we're going to take that reward away. So the brain doesn't get the music if it's not playing ball, if it's not doing what we want. So the sensor says, okay. So the sensor is reading the brain waves and, um, you sitting there with these hooked up to your head, if you're having neurofeedback done, what you're experiencing subjectively is you're going to hear the music getting louder and softer, louder and softer throughout that 30 minute session. Whenever the music's louder, that's when your brain is doing what we want it to, you know, less beta in this case. 
when the music gets softer or goes away, that's when your brain's not doing what we want it to and the reward is taken away. And it's very similar to, uh, so this is a process called operant conditioning, and it's very similar to teaching a new puppy how to do a trick. So, you know, you have your new puppy, you have a, you say to the puppy, sit, and the dog looks at you like, I don't know what you're talking about, buddy, I don't speak human. Um, and so then you, you know, push its bum down to the ground, so it's now in the sitting position, and then you give it a cookie. And the first time you do that, the dog's like, this is amazing, I got a cookie, I have no idea why I got the cookie, the heavens opened up and I got a cookie, but it has not made the connection between it being in the sitting position and the cookie. But if you do that enough times, the dog eventually learns, oh, okay, you say sit, I put my bum on the ground, you give me a cookie, everybody's happy, then you have operantly conditioned that puppy to sit when you say sit. Um, so in a similar manner, by using this music reward system with neurofeedback, you're training your brain that when it has less beta, good things happen. And so eventually your brain learns, learns that pattern, and so it says, okay, let's just have less beta. Um, so during this process of neurofeedback, it's actually um, triggering these neuroplasticity pathways in the brain to start pruning away some of those higher beta um, pathways or neurons that were you know, previously you know, all the rage in your brain, um, and then replacing them with new, or, new lower beta brain waves, so that you are um, neurons rather. So it actually creates these changes um, in the brain to put the brain into a lower beta mode in this example where there was too much beta in the first place. So <clears throat> a couple of the, I think, very fascinating uh, take-home messages with this is that um, when we do neurofeedback, we're you know retraining the brain to do what we want it to, you know, get those brain maps looking better, get the symptoms doing better. It also leads to lasting changes with the uh, in the brain. So. Um, the example I use with my patients all the time is, you know, so if you go to the gym, you know, you're lifting weights because you want to, you know, get bigger bicep muscles or something, you know, it's like you need to put in the work to, to get those muscles to build up. But when, if you stop going to the gym, if you turn into a couch potato, those muscles are unfortunately going to shrink away. Um, with neurofeedback, it's more like you're... Um, so the analogy or example I use with my patients, it's like you've, you know, remodeled your bathroom. So you remodel the bathroom, you have a new, you know, sink, you know, new vanity, you know, new paint on the wall. Um, once you've remodeled that bathroom, it's never going to somehow revert back to the previous bathroom. You know, with the weightlifting, you stop lifting weights and your bathroom is going to revert to the way that it was before. With neurofeedback, it leads to lasting changes, which I think is really great for several reasons. One is that who doesn't love positive lasting changes. Um, the other is that it means that once you've done your neurofeedback, you don't need to keep doing neurofeedback. It's not like going to the gym, which, you know, just as a disclaimer, we should all probably be, you know, exercising on a regular basis, whether it's at the gym or at home or whatnot. Um, but, you know, if, it, um, if you're, if you stop going to the gym, you lose those gains with neurofeedback, you do the work and like you do the neurofeedback training and then you maintain those gains over time. Now, you know, the one little caveat that I mentioned is that just because I've remodeled my bathroom, it doesn't mean that my bathroom is completely impervious to, you know, not looking like a very nice bathroom again. So if someone comes in and spray paints all over the walls or takes a sledgehammer to the vanity or something like that, like my bathroom could, could be damaged, it could be ruined, it might need to be fixed again. Um, so subtext there is that, you know, just because someone's done durant feedback, it doesn't mean they're not going to have another mold exposure and get re-mold intoxicated in the future, or it doesn't mean they're not going to have another car accident that led to that traumatic brain injury or something like that. So of course, hopefully those things would not happen, but um, of course, it doesn't, you know, somehow magically prevent any future um, brain wave imbalances down the road. Um, but the idea is that when you do that neurofeedback work, it leads to these lasting changes, which is what the research studies indicate. And that's, I think, really great when you kind of do the treatments and you're not stuck going in for ongoing treatments for forever. Um, so let's see here. I think, I think that pretty much covered what I wanted to say about the eyes closed neurofeedback. So um, as these as these sessions are done, um, then this um, there's just this gradual retraining. So I guess one thing I will mention before I talk about eyes open neurofeedback is where kind of the, the working out of the gym metaphor does kind of come into play is that it does take time for the uh, neuroplasticity to change. So it's not like, oh, we do one neurofeedback session and the brain's completely retrained. Um, as I talk about in the next slide, you know, generally it takes about four to five sessions to start noticing some change from neurofeedback. We do have some patients who notice differences after two or three sessions, but um, usually it's after about four to five sessions that changes start to be noted. And um, it can take, um, you know, several sessions. If in some chronic cases, it could take, you know, 30 to 40 sessions, possibly more in some cases to um, see the full effects of the neurofeedback to have the neuroplasticity effects get 
the brain map looking as good as we want it to to get those um, clinical symptoms resolved as much as humanly possible. Um, one of the cool things, though, with neurofeedback is because it does lead to those lasting changes, um, neurofeedback doesn't have to be done in like a back-to-back -back manner. It doesn't mean, oh, someone with, you know, every diagnosis under the sun, they've been sick for two decades, you know, they're going to need, you know, 40 neurofeedback sessions. It doesn't mean they have to do 40 sessions in a row. They don't have to do, you know, once once a week for 40 weeks in a row. They can do it in chunks of, of treatments because, again, um, it's like that remodeling of the bathroom. So it's like, okay, like this weekend I'm going to, you know, repaint the walls and then, you know, oh, life's busy, you know, um, three months later, okay, now I'm going to, you know, get a get a new sink like you can do do the project in chunks it doesn't have to be done in uh, you know uh, perfectly back to back because things are um, it does lead to those lasting neurological changes um but 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 it does take some time to see those changes um, as well so that's where the gym analogy kind of comes into play where it's like well you know i don't go to the gym once and i suddenly have you know big beautiful biceps you know you have to go um, you know on a regular basis have to do several sessions to train those muscles the way that we want them to be. Um, eyes open neurofeedback is um, identical in all respects to eyes closed neurofeedback in terms of all the background rationale and number of sessions and all of that. Um, the only difference is that instead of having your eyes closed listening to music, you'd have your eyes open and you're watching a, a video. Um, so they're you know, in our clinic, like we'll uh, oftentimes put on, like, say, a nature documentary or um, some video where there's, say, like music playing, like classical music playing in the background. There's, you know, every 10 seconds or 15 seconds, there's a you know classic art piece or something like that that's shown on the screen. Um, and, you know, for better or for worse, can't you know, do neurofeedback very effectively with um, action movies and, you know, spy thrillers and different things like that. Like nothing that's like really, um, you know, kind of like intense or super exciting. I mean, don't get me wrong. If you're really excited about classic art, maybe, you know, can't use that either. I don't know. Um, but uh, it needs to be like a fairly, fairly tame um, uh, video. But that can be, uh, neurofeedback can be done with eyes open um, instead of eyes closed. And some folks prefer that. There are some advantages of doing eyes closed in some cases, but uh, for some cases, it doesn't matter whether it's eyes open or eyes closed. So um, sessions are typically conducted one to two times per week. Uh, as mentioned, they're typically 30 minutes. Um, some folks, if they're really sensitive, we might start them at a, for a shorter period of time. Or if it's a child and their attention span, I think their ability to sit still is not going to allow for 30 minutes. That's, you know, we'd start with a lower um, amount of time, but um, 30 minutes is generally the maximum amount of time. Uh, sessions can be done in clinic um, or at home with rented equipment. Um, so not every clinic has the home training option. So if you're listening to this and you live in Timbuktu or something like that, I'm like, oh, I'll just, you know, any old clinic will definitely be able to rent me equipment. Not not every clinic does. Um, our clinic does, and, and I know a number of others do. But um, it's, uh, it is feasible to do home training options if there's nobody in your in your area. Uh, and I mentioned it usually takes about four to five sessions to see a change. And then um, ideally another brain map would be done after about eight to 10 sessions. Um, some clinicians will say to not do another brain map until, you know, say completing 15 to 20 sessions. Um, we've been doing brain maps after eight to 10 sessions and we've been seeing notable improvements um, on those follow-up brain maps. Um, I'm not sure if that's because we're, you know, using a lot of other things as well. Uh, we've got, you know, uh, diet in place, we've got the right supplements in place, that type of thing as well. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure, but um, I, my recommendation for my patients has been to do another brain map after eight to 10 sessions. Um, first of all, just to see those positive objective changes, which is always nice to see. It's like, hey, I'm feeling better, but also like how, how are things looking on paper? Hey, it's looking better on paper too. We know we're on the right track. But then also by seeing how the updated brain map looks, it also lets us rejig the protocol um, so that we're, we make sure that we're you know using the most targeted kind of you know um, uh, yeah, up-to-date protocol uh, possible. Because as we're doing the neurofeedback, as things are looking better, well, maybe that region of the brain that we had been training for those first eight to 10 sessions doesn't need to be train there anymore. That's not the main area that needs support. So now the updated brain map will give us a sense of like, oh, we should move the sensors here or do a different protocol um, here or there. So just very quickly, here is a um, follow-up brain map. So this is after a uh, patient did, I think it was nine sessions. So just at the top of the report, um, we see this um, plasticity change um, reading. Um, so there's a 34% um, plasticity change and a 52% normalization. So in other words, uh, the normalization kind of says, well, here's what um, a perfect brain map looks like, and here's what your brain map looks like. Um, so after the nine sessions, 
This patient was 52% of the way towards having a perfectly healthy looking brain map. So um, saw some really nice changes um, here. And then um, the, so we see at the top, that was the first uh, report uh, for magnitude. The bottom was the second report. It's a little bit hard to see here. Um, I think, in my opinion, kind of picked some unfortunate colors. Um, but at the, in the bottom uh, set of magnitude results, which, which is the most, you know, at the, the results after the nine sessions were done, um, all of the brain locations that um, got improved, like say went from red to green, for example, they're circled in green, which again is a little unfortunate because say if we look at beta, uh, so, you know, looking at the top row of brains, you know, the image that's second from the right, you know, there's obviously a lot of beta there, uh, high beta, there's there, you know, the reds and the yellows, you know, it should all be green, it's a really elevated beta. Um, and so in the second set of brains at the bottom, uh, the one that's um, second from the right, so the, the, the new and improved beta, if you will, we can see, oh, it's there's a lot of green now, like over half the spots are green now, that's great. Um, and so a bunch of them are circled in green, but you can't really tell because it was green to begin with. So anyway, it's a little bit hard to read there, but we can see that the beta has notably improved. If we look at the delta, you know, top left compared to bottom left, um, you know, there was only one green location in the top left. Now there's uh, four locations in the bottom left. Um, so that's looking better. Um, and so we're, we're seeing this notable improvement. Even the high beta looks a little bit better. Again, not that we, really, really care about that from a clinical perspective, but it actually indicates there's like somewhat less muscle tension in this person's body now, which makes sense since their beta is lower. And we can see here that the alpha really, you know, it's improved like a very, very little bit. Um, theta wasn't really a problem in the first place, which is great. So the, this brain map is still a work in progress, but we've seen some really notable improvements in magnitude. And then um, looking at the uh, dominant frequency, um, so uh, left side, like left column is the first uh, brain map, right side, like the right column is the um, new and improved brain map or like after after the nine sessions. So we can see here kind of going line to line um, at the top, you know, the overall dominant frequency is about the same. That hasn't really changed notably. The alpha dominant frequency is still quite low um, from, you know, first to second session, but we can see that the beta dominant frequency has improved quite a lot. It went from being super, super slow to now it's in the normal range. So we saw a nice improvement there with that dominant frequency. So again, there's still work to be done with this brain map, but um, we're, we're seeing things shifting in the right direction. And then also at the bottom, uh, we can see that the um, the hypo connectivity looked good, like so the 3% there. So in other words, it's uh, kind of 3% of the way from optimal. It was 3% before, it's 3% now, so it was pretty much perfect to begin with, um, but the hyperconnectivity um, was 84% 84, 84 of the way from normal before, and now it's only 66% of the way from normal. So, um, you know, not a night and day difference, but we're seeing things trending in the right direction. So um, that's uh, just a quick little snippet about what a follow-up um, brain map looks like and how we can contrast that. So uh, very last slide here before the uh, before the, the farewell slide. Um, so what is neurofeedback indicated for? Um, so here, here's a list of different conditions. I'm, I'll just read them out quickly in case folks are just um, listening to this uh, audio only and not seeing the slides. <clears throat> um, so examples would include anxiety, depression, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, OCD, PTSD, chronic fatigue syndrome, complex chronic illness, which of course many folks with complex chronic illness might have several of the other labels here that are on this list, um, seizure disorders, traumatic brain injuries, insomnia, migraines, neurological conditions such as MS and Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's, things like that. Um, and then the final one with the smiley face is biohacking. So um, in my practice, the vast majority of my patients are dealing with complex chronic illness or you know chronic pain or, or you know, different uh, challenging health conditions, shall we say. Um, but I do have a special little subset of patients um, who are primarily interested in biohacking. Um, and um, I, they're, they're near and dear to my heart because I biohack as well. Um, for folks who aren't familiar with the term biohacking, it's basically um, trying to figure out sort of health um, uh, uh, oh my gosh, what's a good definition for biohacking? Um, it's basically trying to figure out different um, 
uh, health strategies to improve your health beyond just an average state of health. So it's like, hey, I feel good, but could I feel even better? My sleep is good, could it be even better? Uh, my exercise performance is good, but could it be even better? I've got good muscle mass, but could it be even better? Um, the, these are the types of questions that plague the minds. <laughs> I'm just being silly there. Uh, fill the minds, I should say, of folks who have kind of caught the biohacking bug. Um, and so neurofeedback is, um, in my opinion, um, <laughs> I would say that it would be an, an indispensable part of the conversation for folks around biohacking um, because it's, in my opinion, uh, one of the very few things that can be done to um, really target our overall neurological function. Um, in our day-to-day, -day, in our modern-day society, I should say, you know, there's just so much flying at us all the time. Like we're very much in a sympathetic nervous system promoting uh, world. Um, we're just really busy. There's information flying at us all the time. And it's something that really I'm seeing so many brain maps. I've seen so many brain maps now, and there is uh, so much beta out there. It's not even funny. So much hyper coherence out there. It's not even funny. So much um, high beta dominant frequencies. In other words, all the revved up kind of stuff going on. It's not even funny. Um, seeing some, you know, depleted um, alpha, you know, indicating um, uh, some, you know, adrenal gland burnout, kind of like some lower energy um, states. It's just a really, really common pattern that I'm seeing, and so. Um, well, ideally, we would somehow return to a you know more balanced state or less less you know more of a parasympathetic world. Um, I, I don't know that that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, so for those of us who want to have our cake and eat it too, um, the um, neurofeedback is something that I think can be really helpful for folks to help try to regulate their nervous systems and and just you know hey I want deeper sleep great neurofeedback could help with that. Um, I want to have a, a more efficient cognitive process processing ability. I want to be able to retain, I want a better memory. I want my ability to, uh, ability to focus on things when I'm learning new things or I'm at work to be better. Neurofeedback can potentially help with that. So kind of biohacking our brains to be as healthy as possible is I think a very um, fun and exciting avenue um, with uh, neurofeedback. Um, but of course, you know, the, the, the priority in my mind and in my practice is like, okay, let's, let's get all the folks who are chronically ill feeling as good as possible. Let's try to get them to like feeling average. And then if they want to biohack from there, that's great. But um, yeah, for folks who are interested in biohacking, the uh, neurofeedback is really something to consider, I think. So that is the end of this podcast episode. Um, every time I record something, I always think I'm going to be done so much sooner. I figure like, oh, this will take me 30 minutes to get through. I see I'm at an hour and 10 minutes. So um, for those of you who have, who have stuck around to the end of the episode, kudos to you. Um, and I hope that this was uh, informative. I hope this was interesting. Um, uh, just here's a list um, here of the places you can find me on social media. Uh, so, and again, for folks who are just uh, audio only here, I'll just mention here, and I have links in the show notes, but uh, Facebook handle is East Coast Naturopathic Clinic. Uh, YouTube channel is Halifax Naturopathic Doctor, where you can see this, um, well, the slides anyways. You won't see me, um, but uh, you'll see the slides anyways. And um, Instagram handle is dr.brianraid.nd. Our clinic website is eastcoastnaturopathic.com. So if you want to get in touch with me or um, uh, you know for you know, booking an appointment or booking with uh, someone at our clinic just go to the website and the contact information is on there and then of course this podcast is the overcoming chronic illness podcast so um, if you would please consider um, subscribing um, to the podcast on whatever podcast platform you like to use I'd greatly appreciate it and uh, if you think this might be um, informative or useful for somebody else that you know please consider passing on the the episode to somebody else to just spread the awareness about this topic so um, this concludes another episode of the Overcoming Chronic Illness podcast. Thank you for your attention and I'll catch you next time.